Hi everyone, my name is Ali Faruqi. I'm one of the students with the MAS uh, program in clinical research, and uh, my independent study project is under the mentorship of Dr. Hatim Hussein. The topic is uh, the pro prognostic and predictive value of TP53 commutation in EGFR mutant patients with non small cell lung cancer or NSCLC, which is the most common type of lung cancer. Uh, a couple of quick notes. Uh, the prognostic value is uh, how well a biomarker can predict the res uh, actually the overall outcome of a disease such as survival, while the predictive value is basically how it can predict the response to treatment. Uh, so a bit of background, um, EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase receptor which is normally found on the surface of epithelial cells. And um, it is involved actually, um, its, its activation results in uh, regulation of multiple uh, downstream signaling pathways which are involved in cell proliferation and survival. Uh, the mutation of these genes uh, results in uh, conformational change in the receptor, which translates into hyperactivation of these downstream pathways uh, and uh, tumor formation. Um, the mutation of um, uh, EGFR mutation actually is uh, the, well, the most uh, well-known, well-established uh, in mutation in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, it has been, uh, you know, uh, it has been related to, uh, sorry, it has been considered as a pharmacogenomic biomarker uh, to, for selecting patients for targeted therapy. And what is targeted therapy? Actually, it's a newer addition to treatment modalities for non-small cell lung cancer, and it's basically what it does, it just, they target specific driver gene mutations, such as EGFR. And uh, by doing so, they inhibit, um, you know, a wide range of uh, tumor functions. Um, and as you can see here, um, they, they're in non-small cell lung cancer, they are called TKIs, or tyrosine kinase receptors. They work on, the, on inhibiting the cytoplasmic domain of the EGFR receptor. And uh, by doing so, they inhibit all these downstream pathways. Uh, as you can see, osimertinib is one of these uh, TKI uh, group of drugs. Uh, TKIs are revolutionary drugs. Uh, they have been um, considered a major step forward in, the, in um, actually towards individualist th therapy and precision medicine in non-small cell lung cancer. They have shown promising results in improving uh, survival, and nowadays they are used as the first line of treatment for uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, now, t back to the um, mutations. Um, EGFR uh, mutation, uh, actually, uh, the highest rates of EGFR mutation in non-small cell lung cancer is seen, uh, is observed, actually, in, uh, or observed in uh, East Asians, female non-smokers, and uh, patients with uh, adenocarcinoma in their histopathology. Uh, there are two major types of EGFR mutation. Uh, uh, one, uh, one type is a group of mutation which leads to, uh, to in higher responsiveness to TKI treatments. And um, these are DEL19 and L858R. Uh, the other type of mutations are the TKI resistance mutations, uh, which include exon 20 insertion and T790M. Exon 20 insertion uh, is um, actually um, uh, one of, the, it's, it's a, an infrequent finding in non-small cell lung cancer patients, and uh, it is considered as a primary source of re resistance to treatment, which means basically patients who carry this type of mutation normally do not respond well to TKI treatments. Uh, on the other hand, about 50 to 60 percent of the patients who receive TKI at some point during the treatment, they develop a new type of mutation, which is called T790M, and, and T790M, and it is considered secondary mechanism of resistance. So here, what you can see in the first picture is uh, it shows that the TKIs have been developed in a way to be a good fit for uh, the mutant EGFR receptor. And uh, with the uh, development of the new mutation of T790M, that fitting, that binding doesn't uh, happen anymore. So the third generation of the TKIs have been uh, developed to address this issue, as you can see, osimertinib, or the third generation uh, of the mutations here. 
uh, can, um, of the TKIs can bind to both the EGFR mutant receptor as well as the ones which carry the T790M mutation. Now let's go and talk about uh, the second gene involved. Uh, it's uh, the TP53 or tumor suppressor gene, uh, which is considered uh, the uh, guardian of genome and um, uh, it, because it has a critical role in preventing tumor formation. Uh, its mutation uh, actually results uh, in, um, you know, loss of uh, this um, uh, main uh, function of um, preventing, suppressing tumor formation. It impacts a wide, um, you know, uh, actually multiple aspects of cell biology. It results in genomic instability and uh, leads to tumor progression. It is the most commonly mutated gene in all cancer types, including non-small cell lung cancer. And um, it is a very complicated, uh, yet very interesting uh, target for pharmaceutical interventions. But what makes it complicated is uh, its wide nature of uh, mutation, which ranges from gain of function to loss of function. It has been associated with um, uh, more aggressive behavior of the tumor, tumor, higher rates of relapse, and increased resistance to chemotherapy. Uh, however, the problem is the correlation between these uh, two uh, mutations, EGFR and TP53 uh, commutations, with clinical outcomes in terms of survival and response to treatment for TKIs is controversial, and that's the problem that we are trying uh, to find the answer for. So we are hypothesizing that TP53 commutation uh, is a negative predictor of um, uh, overall uh, of survival, which means that it leads to shorter overall survival. And we also uh, are uh, hypothesizing that it is a negative predictor of response to treatment, to TKI treatment, which means it leads to shorter TTF or time to treatment failure. One quick, so the OS, uh, the overall survival, is the prognostic part of the hypothesis. The TTF is the um, predictive part. Uh, one quick note, usually in cancer studies, uh, uh, PFS or um, progression-free survival is the end point, which is used to assess uh, the effect efficacy of treatment. Uh, it is based on the resist criteria, and it needs medical imaging techniques for assessment and confirmation. Since we don't have that information, we will be relying on using TTF. It is a surrogate for PF. It is a surrogate endpoint. It's a real-world surrogate endpoint, and it has uh, shown close uh, correlation with PFS. And uh, it is actually basically the time uh, from the initiation of treatment to discontinuation of treatment for any reason. It can be disease progression, it can be side effects and toxicity, this, um, patient preference, or even death. So it's a, uh, the good thing about using this um, endpoint is it will give us the opportunity to look beyond disease progression as the reason for premature discontinuation of treatment. For the purpose of this presentation, I mean, uh, since I'm in the middle of collecting data for TTF, I will be only focusing on the results for OS. So the study cohort consisted of EGFR mutant patients uh, who, uh, with advanced non-small cell lung cancer who have, uh, who, with the history of receiving TKI as, at Moore cancer, Morse Cancer Center. We looked at the wide range of variables uh, from demographics, tumor characteristics, treatment uh, regimens, genomic uh, profiles and endpoints of OS, and we will be looking at TTF. One quick thing, TKI generations is from one generation, first to third generations, the fourth is in development. The, and by the TKI line of treatment, uh, I mean that if it, what they were used as the first line of treatment or second or beyond that. Um, for uh, then overall survival is uh, the time from the date of diagnosis to the time of death and the, for the surviving patients is the last follow-up date and they have been censored at that uh, date. The stati statistical analysis used uh, was uh, T-test and um, Fisher's exact test to compare um, actually to, to test the differences between the TP53 mutant and wild type group of patients. And I use time to event analysis for that. I use Kaplan-Meier methods to estimate the overall survival and survival curves. Cost proportional hazard regression models were used to, cal uh, to estimate the hazard ratio and compare survivals after adjusting for potential confounders in the multivariable <coughs> models, excuse me. And the uh, SPSS was used for analysis. So for the purpose of this slide, I'm going to show you the, uh, the rounded numbers, so there will be no decimals, so hopefully you will have fewer Tylenols at the end of my presentation. 
68 uh, out of eight, uh, actually out of 88 patients with EGFR mutations, 68 patients met our inclusion criteria. The mean age at the time of diagnosis was 64 years with a wide range of 35 to 88 years. Uh, they were mostly female, Caucasians, and never smokers. In terms of treatment, the, so, <clears throat> about 77% received the first, uh, TKI as their first run line of treatment. And in terms of generations, mostly the majority received a combination of first and third generation, followed by the third generation. Uh, in terms of the mutation types, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, TKI sensitive uh, was seen in 60%, uh, and Del 19 was the, ma the, the major one, seen in 60% of the patients. 30% had L858R, and uh, for the TKI resistance, uh, about one third of the patient had uh, T790M, and only 4% had exon 20 uh, insertion, the rest had none. EGFR amplification, which is the increased copy number of the gene, was seen in one third of the patients, and not surprising. Uh, we had a 60, uh, TP53 mutation in 60% of our patients. Com in comparing, uh, comparison between the TP53 mutant and wild type, uh, they looked basically, uh, the, um, uh, in terms of clinical characteristics, they looked uh, similar. There was no significant difference except for EGFR amplification, which was seen more uh, in 51% of the mutant group compared to the 7% of the wild type group. That was the only fi uh, finding, which was statistically significant. Uh, median overall uh, survival uh, was, uh, sorry, median overall survival was uh, numerically, as, an, as, a, as a primary endpoint, was numerically in favor of TP53 to be prognostic, um, uh, in favor of uh, prognostic value of TP53. You can see that uh, those patients with this mutation had uh, over a shorter overall survival, 44 months versus 50, uh, 54. But as you will see later, this difference did not reach statistical significance. So that's basically comparing the TP53 wild type and mutant. And I'm just going to be very fast. So there was no significant uh, difference here except for the EGFR amplification, which re reached statistical uh, significance. So uh, as you can see, there, uh, there, um, there's a trend towards inferior overall survival in TP53 mutant population but it did not reach, uh, in the adjusted model, um, it did not reach statistical significance. The, predi the significant uh, predictors uh, included smoking history uh, with the hazard ratio of 2.31, exon 20 insertion, not receiving first-line chemotherapy, and EGFR amplification. Uh, one point that I would like to make is in, in regards to exon 20 insertion, just bear in mind the white confidence, confidence interval that I will mention in the next slide. So smoking history uh, was um, one of the predictive factors for shorter overall su survival. Patients who were uh, smokers had um, uh, about 34, uh, the median overall survival of 34 months compared to uh, 56 for never smokers. Exon 20 insertion uh, was only seen in 4% of the population. It's usually a very infrequent finding uh, in the population. And given the wide confidence interval and very s uh, small sample size, uh, I believe that our uh, study has not been powered enough to, uh, to uh, test correctly the significance of this variable. Patients who did not receive chemotherapy as their first line of treatment had uh, shorter overall survival. EGFR amplification is an interesting finding. It is an increased number of copy of uh, the genes, usually translate to the overexpression of their uh, genes, which means more receptors, and it is usually associated with lower overall survival. Now the question is, um, should we be looking at EGFR amplification by itself as a prognostic and predictive factor? Should we uh, consider it in com uh, you know, with um, EGFR mut mutation as coexistence to, to evaluate uh, its effect on responsiveness to treatment? And may, does it work as a mechanism, resistance mechanism, maybe uh, as a secondary or acquired resistance mechanism, or is it there from the beginning? So um, the findings of this study emphasizes the complexity and importance of finding the oncogenic, uh, oncogenic the concurrent uh, oncogenic uh, mutations, uh, and which may impact overall survival and clinical outcomes in order to find the best strategy, treatment strategies for the patients, to find the right TKI treatment, 
right sequencing, right combination, maybe it, maybe it is be best to be used in combination with other modalities of treatment such as immunotherapy or chemotherapy. Also, it is important to find those uh, that have the possibility to be used as a target for future uh, tar uh, targeted therapies. This uh, study was limited um, in some ways. Uh, first, uh, it, it is limited because of this retrospective uh, design. Uh, having all the data coming from a s uh, relatively small sample size and one single s and a single center uh, affects uh, the internal and external validity of the results to some degree. Uh, lack of enough data on different types of uh, TP53 mutations was another one. Next generation sequencing is the method which was used to analyze the genomic uh, and profiles of the patients. So based on the source of it, whether it comes from the tissue or it comes from the plasma, there were differences. There are also unknown confounders which might have affected uh, the, uh, the, the results. So the future exploration will be an analysis of the TTF uh, endpoint, analysis of other co-occurring co uh, mutations, stratification based on maybe the type of TP53 mutation or EGFR mu mutation types, or even looking at those patients who had longer overall survival and compare them with the shorter ones. Propensity score matching is another technique that we can use to base and to match the patients based on the TKI generations and lines of treatments. And I am hoping to be able to get a larger cohorts to validate the, the findings in that and in bigger cohorts. Just a quick thing, uh, although we didn't find the TP53 to be a prognostic uh, you know, um, um, biomarker in our group of patients, there are tons of efforts going on to develop um, target therapy for P53 protein, uh, just ranging from structural co correctors to vaccines. But it is a challenging uh, target for um, uh, t targeting targeted therapy, given its diversity, uh, diverse nature of the mutations, complexity of its pathways, and the fact that it doesn't offer the accessibility of receptor ligand uh, interaction or enzymatic act, uh, you know, active site. Uh, despite all of this, the hope is uh, that there will be successful development of uh, targeted therapy for TP53. So there will be, we can get one step closer to precision medicine. By that, conclude my. This one? No, that, that when you have the four different Kaplan Meyer plots. Oh, the next one. And then you have the, uh, and that one on the left, and then on the, the first line chemo, what does that mean again? Oh, the patients who did not receive chemotherapy as their first line of treatment. So they either received immunotherapy or they received TKI. So basically, it shows that patients who received chemotherapy, they did, what, they did better having sh longer overall survival. It doesn't necessarily mean that using TKI is not the best, I'm guessing, because using TKI as a first line of treatment is sort of like a recent development over the past few years. Maybe we don't have enough time for maturation of the data of the patients who receive it as a first line of therapy. Well, to, uh, TMB or tumor uh, burden, uh, that, that's what you're asking for, right? Uh, it's actually uh, mostly used for selecting patients for immunotherapy. It is, uh, you know, just for, for the audience, TMB is usually the number of the somatic mutations in one, in one megabase of uh, coding area of DNA. And it, uh, it is actually used for, to immu if the patients have, well, it is reported as either patient has low, intermediate, or high, TMB or tumor burden. Those patients who have higher burdens, they're usually better candidates for immunotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1, PD-L1, anti, you know, antibody for those. But the correlation between TMB and TKIs is under study. I've seen multiple studies, and uh, what ba they basically suggest is having more mutations <coughs> mean more resistance mechanisms. 
there have been studies looking at their relationship with TKI to see, but we couldn't use that information, unfortunately, because it was only available in 20% of our population. We looked at it, but we couldn't have enough information. I wonder what I was going to ask more. Yeah. Now, does it seem like, you know, amplification of, of the EFR was, was, is one of the strong predictors, yes. yet, uh, and, and the, 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 the T53 mutation was a predictor of, of, of amplification, or what, or, or was it an association? Which way was it, though? You think the amplification of the EFR is related to the, the mutation, or is it vice versa, that amplification causes mutation? Yeah, does that make sense at all? Do you know which directionality of the relationship between the, the, the T53 mutants and, and, and the EFR amplification? Uh, I'm not quite sure about that. Just the only thing is uh, EGFR amplification means higher copy numbers, usually overexpression, more receptors, which leads to poor overall survival. And TP53 can work in a different way by just, you know, addressing, you know, just targeting different pathways. I'm not sure if those two are necessarily related, but there are, that's the question I put forward that maybe we should look at the EGFR amplification in, uh, in addition to the mutations of EGFR. But it's correlation with TP53, I'm not sure if what I have the answer. Was that the beginning, or was that what the main relationship of the um, with amplification? Sorry. Oh, the amplification was the only, that's the one that you're mentioning? The amplification was the only one which showed difference between the TP53 uh, mutant and the wild type group. Right. Yes, that's you're asking, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it just like, I'm, I'm not sure if I have the, the answer for that. Yeah. I don't know. The relationships between the EGFR amplification and, and other mutational types been established, or is this the first time this has been? No, there has been studies like this showing the, and the importance of looking at EGFR amplification on, in addition to EGFR mutation itself. So there are studies that shows its relationship to poor prognosis and lack of responsiveness to treatment. That's what I was mentioning. It does, is it possible that it works as a uh, primary um, you know, mechanism of um, resistance, or is it something patients develop down the, down the road? So those are the things that we can uh, look at the data to see if we can get something more out of it. But um, it's a very interesting finding. And there's been other studies showing the results like this. You may have mentioned it, but from which uh, source did this data come from? Uh, it's Dr. Hussein's clinic. So it just, I was given only the unstructured data. I don't have access to EMRs, and just limited by that quite a lot. 